Hello and welcome to Treatment of Congestive Heart Failure. My name is David Woodruff. I hope you'll enjoy this short video where we talk about what the treatment of heart failure can contain. There are three major priorities to the treatment of heart failure. That includes increasing the supply of oxygen to the heart, decreasing the demand of oxygen on the heart, and thirdly, preventing complications. To better understand why we are using some treatments at some times and other treatments at other times, it might be helpful to understand the different classifications of how bad heart failure can be. Now notice that the New York Heart Association is doing their classification based upon what kind of symptoms the patient's having and what kind of influence that has on the activities of daily living. So for example, class 1 heart failure, there's no limitations on activities. The patient's able to exercise and carry out their normal activities. With class 2, now the person's having mild limitations on activities. Maybe they're having some shortness of breath or having to sit down after walking up a couple flights of stairs. Class 3, there is a marked limitation. The person's really having difficulty being able to get things done. And then at class 4, we have any physical activity causing symptoms. This is the kind of person that can't even get out of bed to be able to carry out their activities of daily living. In addition, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have staging guidelines they use as well. Stage A indicates a high risk for developing heart failure, whereas stage B says that there's evidence of structural heart damage already, which could be leading to heart failure. There doesn't have to be any symptoms of heart failure at this time. Stage C, we have structural heart damage with symptoms. And then finally, stage D, we have a medically refractory end-stage heart failure that would only be able to be treated with surgery or devices that improve cardiac output. Well, as with any disease, prevention is the best treatment. Smoking cessation, very, very important. Smoking not only limits the amount of oxygen getting to the heart, but puts more stress on the heart by causing the heart to beat harder and causing vasoconstriction. Managing the blood pressure is important as well, so we're not putting undue stress on the heart. Increasing physical activity, so that we have physical activity 30 minutes a day, a minimum of five days a week. Watching that body mass index, and the waist circumference also to maintain a normal weight or fairly normal weight so we're not putting too much stress on the heart. Medically, there's some things we can do to prevention as well, including having the diabetics maintain their hemoglobin A1C level at less than 7, maintaining our antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants in people who had previous clots, Maybe blocking the renin angiotensin aldosterone system by using some of the medications that do that, ACE inhibitors and ACE blockers. Beta blockers will help to slow the heart down and decrease some of the workload on the heart. And by an influenza vaccine and trying to prevent the flu, which puts stress on the body as a whole. Some of the standard medical therapies that are used for heart failure include using angioconverting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitor medications. So these are medications that are going to block the angiotensin, the running angiotensin system and help to block that vasoconstriction that is the end result. ACE inhibitors will help to lower the blood pressure and reduce the workload on the heart. Angiotensin receptor blockers, these are medications that do the same thing as ACE inhibitors. There's no particular benefit to them other than the fact that they don't tend to cause coughing. Coughing is a side effect of ACE inhibitors, happens in about 20% of patients who take ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers, as was mentioned before, are going to slow the heart down. This has two benefits to the heart. Increasing the amount of oxygen getting to the heart because we have a longer diastolic filling time, while at the same time slowing the heart down so that we put less workload stress on the heart and the heart requires less oxygen than in return. Digoxin will also slow and strengthen the heart and may also help to prevent some lethal and rapid dysrhythmias that could occur as a result of having conduction abnormalities. Diuretics may be necessary if the patient is retaining fluid from the renin angiotensin and aldosterone systems. And an aldosterone antagonist, such as spiralactone, may also be required to block the aldosterone system and prevent an excess of fluid on board. 
Hydralazine and nitrates seem to have a benefit, especially in ACE intolerant patients, and African Americans seem to have an increased benefit from that combination of drugs. Coumadin, also warfarin, this is an anticoagulant that will help to prevent the person from developing blood clots, which could lead to more ischemic disease of the heart and could lead to furthering, worsening the heart failure. Treating anemia, depression, and other comorbidities is also helpful in improving cardiac output. Although listed as standard medical therapies, these are really therapies that are going to be done in the patient who has an acute episode of heart failure and is hospitalized. We may use dibutamine, which is a medication that's going to strengthen the heart and increase the cardiac output. That is also going to increase the workload on the heart. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as milrinone are medications that cause vasodilation and also increase the contractile force of the myocardium. Again, potentially could possibly increase the workload on the heart. The benefit is that they decrease preload and afterload at the same time, so that should also help to improve cardiac output in a patient with heart failure. Unfortunately, it's difficult to get the patient off the medication because it works so well. Nitroglycerin will decrease workload on the heart by decreasing the preload, the amount of volume coming to the heart, by causing vasodilation and helping to pull blood out in the periphery. Sodium nitroprusside works on the arterial side, so it's going to help to lower blood pressure, especially if the patient's blood pressure were very high. Natricor is a synthetic BNP, so it's a synthetic med medication that is going to mimic what our B-type natriuretic peptide would do. Avoid diuretic monotherapy, high-dose furosemide, for example. We want to avoid that kind of monotherapy because that is not addressing the whole problem. All we're doing is we're just simply decreasing the volume on board and not treating some of the underlying problems that are leading to the high volume. In addition to our medical therapies, there's also electrical therapies that we may use. We want optimal medical therapy first, obviously, because it's easier to do and less invasive, but we can do biventricular pacing. That is a possibility in order to be able to get those ventricles pumping at the same time. They put two pacing wires in, one in the right ventricle, one in the left, and then we're able to pace both ventricles at the same time. There does get to be a little bit of discoordination between the two ventricles when the patient starts to developing remodeling or ventricular hypertrophy. And platinum cardio defibrillators may be something that would be optimal in this patient because there is an increased risk of sudden cardiac death in patients who have heart failure. So we may want to implant a cardio defibrillator to try to prevent a lethal dysrhythmia. Obviously not a first line type of treatment, but a ventricular assist device is one of the devices we can use for patients who have very unstable heart failure while we're waiting for a heart transplant. Literally what it does is it assists the ventricle by taking blood out of the ventricle and pumping it through a pump on the outside of the patient's body and then sending the blood back in to the patient's aorta. So it's increasing the cardiac output in that way. Now these devices are de technically designed to be ambulatory, but uh, it's very difficult for people to ambulate with these most of the time because of their underlying heart failure and their underlying conditions they're not stable enough they are not strong enough going into their heart failure to be able to use this a balloon pump is another type of therapy that is designed to be used in the hospital and it's just for rescue therapy until we can get the patient stabilized or until maybe some other device can be implanted. A balloon pump inflates a balloon inside the aorta and then deflates it immediately before systole so that it creates a vacuum in the aorta making it easier for the heart to pump. At the same time after the aortic valve closes the balloon inflates again pushing blood out of the aorta down toward the body up toward the head to increase the cardiac output and increase the blood pressure. Some additional treatment modalities may include a cabbage so open heart surgery Myocardial reconstruction may be possible. They may have to go in and remove some sections of the myocardium that are no longer functioning. They may have to do a valve replacement. So having an abnormal valve, having an affected valve, could cause the patient to have heart failure, and they may have to go in and repair or replace it. 
what you're showing here is called the heart net and it's similar to the cork cap that's used to cover the outside of the heart so that the heart cannot stretch as much. This helps to limit the size of the heart in patients who have very weak ventricles. Cardiac transplant would really be the optimal treatment for a patient who has severe heart failure, a class 4 type heart failure, and the patient's not able to carry out their ADLs. So this slide here is showing what our different types of treatment may require. Depending upon the patient's cardiac output, in this case listed as cardiac index on the left, and the patient's pulmonary artery occlusive pressure, meaning the amount of volume overload the patient has, the patient may end up having severe heart failure. In the bottom right corner, we have both a high amount of fluid overload and a low cardiac index. This would indicate or the, the symptoms we'd see associated with this would be hypoperfusion, pulmonary congestion, and our treatment would be inotropes, medications like that, the butamine, a vasodilator like our nitroglycerin, and an intra-aortic balloon pump or surgery. On the other hand, we want our patient to get back up to the area in the upper left quadrant. A fantastic website to use in your practice is the Heart Failure Society of America, hfsa.org. Heart Failure Society of America has a lot of great information on their site, including additional resources to help you to stay up to date in the current treatment of heart failure. I hope you'll use that resource and look into it as a possible resource for additional continued learning. Thank you for joining me for treatment of congestive heart failure. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.